Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfans Sukunik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, and today I'm delighted to be joined by the author of the A Human Manifesto Activism for the End of the Anthropocene, Patricia McCormack. Okay, Patricia, thank you so much for being with me here today. Welcome, it's an honor. Um, first off, uh, can you tell me just a little bit about yourself and the work that you've done over the years? Well, I am a professor of continental philosophy at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. And I'm originally from Melbourne, Australia, where I received my PhD in feminist philosophy and continental philosophy at Monash in Melbourne. Um, my undergraduate was actually in classics. Um, but in that uh, environment, I was always interested in some of the themes that remain in my work today, because in classics, I was really interested in things like uh, gender ambiguity mm -hmm. and gore and yes. different manifestations of the body. Um, so I've always had this kind of stream of feminist, queer, but also metamorphic uh, ide I guess you would call it an ideology, actually, because even okay. though it's not dogmatic or consistent, it's definitely a an interest and a philosophical desire to make sort of what we understand as our human subjectivity mm -hmm. different, to manifest it differently, to create uh, variable alternatives to the kind of very template heteronormative regime i guess so yeah so i have a pretty traditional background mm -hmm. um i was raised catholic if you can believe that taught by <laughs> nuns um but my yeah i've been consistently studying philosophy from ancient up to contemporary post-structuralism and increasingly my work although it's diverted into things like film philosophy mm -hmm. um and literary philosophy it's usually been interested in larger questions of ethics and activism. Okay, fantastic. Um, you've written a lot of works. Um, the A Human Manifesto, Activism for the End of the Anthropocene is, is just the most recent one, uh, as far as I know. Um, Anthropocene, I have to confess, was not, was not a word I was familiar with before reading your book. Would you mind defining the term for our audience? So. There recently was an announcement that we are now living in the sixth age of mass extinction and it is the age known as the Anthropocene because it is the first geological earth age that has been created by, depending on where you get your definition, there's a couple of different conflicting definitions, but mm -hmm. the main mm -hmm. consistent definition is that the Anthropocene is the first natural era that is no longer natural because it is defined and impacted primarily by human activity. Okay. So it's not a geological era that we occupy. It is mm -hmm. a geological era that we have actually created and we have manifested. And what that really says is that the impact of human agency on the environment, not as an external thing, but the environment as an ecology of life on earth, ourself included, is now in terms of our relationship with nature controlled and impacted by us in a way that has never before occurred in any other geological era. Okay, excellent. And in your book, um, you're basically positioning the Anthropocene, uh, well, the a, the a human in defiance of the Anthropocene. Uh, so again, just for the benefit of our audience or for people that may not have read the book yet, um, how do you define a human? Well, I chose a human because I have always been interested, uh, since it's existed, in post-human philosophy, because post-human philosophy is the idea that we should stop asking the really tedious humanist questions like, why am I here? How can I live forever? What is the meaning of life? These are the three right. questions and religion seeks to answer them and transcendental metaphysical philosophy seeks to answer them. So it doesn't matter whether you're a scientist or a religious zealot or just a philosopher, 
those three questions seem to be over and over again. And to me, all they represent is existential male angst. And it's okay. a pretty privileged kind of angst as well. And so I was interested in post-human philosophy because post-human philosophy includes everything from feminism, post-colonialism and queer theory to a sort of more cosmic idea of deep ecology and how to live differently. And then I got to the point where I thought, well, a lot of post-human philosophy is returning to those same old questions of why am I here? What is the meaning of life? And especially yeah. in terms of, say, transhumanism, how can yeah. we live forever? Mm -hmm. I was not, those questions didn't seem ethically important or urgent to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So I coined the term a human because it means kind of neither human but not not human. So the problem in a lot of post-human philosophy is that it fetishizes the other. So, for example, you get men fetishizing femininity or you get white people co-opting uh, indigenous tribality and okay. tenets. Yeah. You get humans co-opting so-called animal behavior as if we can get inside of the head of animals and i didn't like that kind of co-optive fetishism so i wanted to acknowledge that we can't not be human we are human we're not you know we're not becoming yeah. insect we're not becoming indigenous but some of us don't want to embrace human power and human privilege mm -hmm. some of us are resistant to that and some of us don't believe in the hierarchical structure of life where humans are at the zenith and humans are the most important. Right. Um, and so A means sort of neither, neither, you know, it's a non-binary kind of term. Yeah. Um, and I took that from the philosopher Felix Guattari, who talks about asemiosis, which is something that is both meaningful, but not dogmatically meaningful. So I guess a human means we are still human, but we are defiant toward our humanism. We are yes. not dogmatically human. Okay, excellent. Um, in your words, what is the A Human Manifesto and what does it hope to achieve? What do you hope to achieve with this work? Ultimately, the A Human Manifesto seeks to liberate the earth from human damage. Really mm -hmm. put in, in you know, one sentence, that, that's it. Yeah. And there are certain techniques that I propose. Um, the first is abolitionist veganism, mm -hmm. which is an absolute refusal of all oppression of other life. The second is a flattening of the hierarchical understanding of life, where even within humans, we have this human's better than that human, you know, this is where things like racism and sexism come from. I encourage an embrace of art as a way to think about different techniques for living mm -hmm. because art even though it's fiction it still has the ability to manifest different ways of acting which yes. are yes. materially true mm -hmm. for, for, for the um you know for the benefit of this podcast the other is human extinction i do propose antinatalism and then finally, I propose a care of the earth until we are gone. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very interesting that a lot of the visceral reaction, and I'm sure that your listeners, and I'm sure that you yourself are used to this, that when you say that you're antinatalist, instead of people thinking, oh, okay, that means not bringing into the world lives that don't exist, right. they automatically think you want to kill babies, so you're an yeah. infanticidalist, Right. Um, and also you want to murder everyone. Like, right. right. And what that says to me most interestingly is that a very anthropocentric compulsion to understanding anything is through violence. Mm -hmm. So if you say you're antinatalist, instead of saying, oh, so, you know, there's too many people in the world, humans in general whether there's a lot or a little have a tendency to kill animals and to not really treat each other very well mm -hmm. instead of thinking that people automatically think you want to kill babies yeah. and you want everyone to die right and so why don't you way, just kill the hate, yourself the hate kind of... yeah. Yeah. yeah now 
that's a really interesting question because I know a lot of anti-natalists and a lot of veganists, we, we do have suicidal feelings sure. in a very practical, pragmatic manner. Mm -hmm. And it raises questions about death because I'm also interested in death activism. Yeah. The access to death for some is very easy to the point of being enforced. Mm -hmm. And activism, and like for others, death is hard. You can't just, yeah. you know, buy a vial of pentobarbital at the chemist because right. you're fed up. So even those people who are saying, why don't you go first, need to sort of contemplate the fact that it's not that easy to go first. Exactly. Um, so it does raise larger questions about access to death, about who whose life matters and we're in the midst of a pandemic where we're seeing yeah. that, you know, this is absolutely not a democratic virus. That right. people of colour are dying exponentially more. Uh, people who live in poverty are dying more. And um, vulnerable people, uh, disabled people also are dying more. So yeah. death is still being imposed. There is still a kind of economic eugenics and genocide and antinatalism, as you know, would refuse that sense of population control, who goes, who stays, and also the risks of eugenics mm -hmm. uh, or genocide. Um, I, I am also really waiting to hear why people have children. I'm, I'm still uh -huh. waiting for a good answer. I'm really waiting. Me too. I've had, yeah. this, I've had this discussion with, you know, really great philosophers that I respect. Yeah. And when you exhaust the argument, it gets down to, well, I just wanted to. And I'm also noticing the um, those people who, you know, love their children to death now that they're stuck indoors Lovely. with them. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much anymore. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to ask a little bit about like, how long have you been an antinatalist? How did you first come across th this philosophical position? I, um, I have never wanted children. Mm -hmm. Never. My reasons when I was young was, and I, I, I thought about this when I was very young. Um, I thought psychologically being responsible for the development of another person's psyche is an overwhelming responsibility. Mm -hmm. And even, even as a very early teen, like 12 years old, I, I thought there was a huge amount of hubris involved in thinking that you could impact in unconscious and conscious ways profoundly on the development of another human being. And you could do that and produce someone who was okay. I really mm -hmm. never thought that was possible. I just, um, and I even stand by the argument that good parents don't produce happy people. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. I think, you know, I think some people are happy, but also we live in a society where happiness is a very vague notion. So yeah. I, I, so from an early age, but, um, I, but I didn't, I hear the word antinatalist, obviously, you know, that was a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, I was always very resistant to the heteronormative narrative of grow up, get married, have babies, die. I always found that incredibly oppressive. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty misogynistic. I thought that the idea that while we claim to live in a society where you know, parents are equal and now we can have um, gay parents. There's still this notion that women have babies and women are nurturers. Yeah. And I think while I think that the philosophy of care mm -hmm. is a feminist philosophy that yeah. could be applied to the world. Sure. I think the responsibility of women to be reproducers is devastatingly oppressive. Absolutely. And I think from a queer perspective, there is no room for that kind of narrative to exist. 
Right. You don't have to be gay to be queer. Um, but you also see a lot of people shaming single mothers as if they're parthenogenic, like the baby just arrived <laughs> on, its, on its own. Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of other related elements in society that oppress women who breed, who oppress women who don't breed. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, I think that it is actually a really radical feminist liberation to say no to reproduction. Absolutely. And I also think in terms of people who identify as masculine or male, the idea of progeny and bloodline is incredibly eugenic mm -hmm. and expensive and stupid. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah. And, I, and I'd like to ask you a little bit more about feminism just in, in a little, in a little bit, um, because I, I think that's a, it's a, an extremely important subject that is growing in antinatalism. Um, I just out of curiosity, do, are, are you active at all in any antinatalist, uh, social media on the internet? I mean, do you peruse any of the, the video yeah, work yeah. and all that? Yeah. Yeah. But only the vegan ones. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And obviously that's one of the biggest uh, parts of contention within the antinatalist uh, community is uh, many still fight against veganism. And uh, obviously I'm, I'm vegan. I've been vegan for three years now. Um, but yes, it's an unfortunate, it's unfortunate that that, that battle still rages on um, within antinatalism. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in the place your work has in relation to other forms of antinatalism. So I wanted to ask you just briefly about Vehement, uh, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. I have to confess that when I first heard about your work, uh, I honestly thought that you were attempting a bit of a, bit of a, a, a Vehement 2.0. Um, because you seem to wish for the animals to inherit the earth, so to speak. Les Knight, uh, the founder of Vehement, was on the show and was very excited about your work, by the way. Um, yeah, he, sent me, he sent me a lovely email, actually. Oh, good. Was, you know, I had like 50 <laughs> hate emails and then, you know, a nice email from the Vehemps guy. So that was oh, pretty cool. Actually. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, Les, Les is awesome. I, I really appreciate talking to Les anytime. Um, yeah, you, you, you talk a little bit about in your book... Um, but I just wanted to ask you what your feelings are about vehement and if you consider, I, you know, I know you said it in your book, but if you consider yourself part of that particular movement at all uh, and what you believe separates you from vehement. Well, it's one of those situations where I would, I would argue with the hemp people, but I would defend them with natalists. Okay. You know what I mean? So like if I had some breeder telling me blah, 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 but what about vehement? I would I would defend vehement, and I would um, right. Uh, hemp, and I would and I would um, yeah. So with the hemp, um, I guess there is a faction, although correct me if I'm wrong, that are a bit kind of hedonistic, like you know, let's let's go extinct, but on our way out, let's burn our bridges and consume, destroy, blah blah blah. Oh yes, sure, sure, sure. Um, but I know that's just one one faction. Um, but in general, the hemp's, I guess they're a little more kind than I am because, <laughs> you know, they, it, it is the voluntary human extinction movement. And yeah. while I don't advocate murder, sure, sure, sure. Um, I am pretty confrontational to breeders. Uh -huh. I'm not, yeah. not forgiving. And so I think that possibly their rhetoric is a little more forgiving than mine. Mm -hmm. I also, though, think that the hemp are pretty amorphous. Like they do, they, they you know, it doesn't seem to be a strict dogmatic ideology. So I don't really think that there's any particular antagonism between my work and theirs. Okay. I just think that, I just think that I demand people account for their breeding right so in a way it's more about prove to me why you should breed than right. about voluntary human extinction 
Right, I can understand it completely. Yeah, it's a it's a very different stylistic approach, and so I appreciate that completely. Yeah, um, you you say a little bit in your book that you believe antinatalism is still very informed by environmentalism. I've actually found exactly the opposite to be true. Um, so I was curious why you feel that to be true. I feel that sort of ended essentially with vehement. I mean, of course, there are uh, groups like. Um, Extinction Rebellion. I mean, some of these groups that are, uh, they're antinatalistic in a sense, but they don't call themselves... Rebellion of Britain. Britain. Yeah, I guess that's true. I don't know. I've, I, I've heard from some people in Extinction oh Rebellion that are... I, 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 so I'm a little confused by what they believe and don't believe to say the truth. Yeah, but, well, yeah. My experience with Extinction Rebellion is they're all about the next generation. Okay, all right. They're, yeah. they're, 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 they really attach themselves to this symbol of the child as futurity, which mm-hmm. I think is a detrimental um, ideology that really... Um, Absolutely. It, it derails, you know, imminent concerns that need addressing right yeah. now. So, no, I'm not a fan of Extinction Rebellion. Again, right. I would defend them against, like, mass corporations. Sure, of course, yeah. But... Yeah. But face to face, I would argue that if you're not an antinatalist vegan, then you're not really concerned about the environment. You're just narcissistic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you talk a lot about art uh, in your book, which I was very, very pleased to see. Um, I, you know, I'm very interested in the idea of art, antinatalism as an art movement. I think it has huge potential in that regard. I myself am uh, an antinatalist activist artist. Um, so again, I was very excited to read that part of your book, um, and that did resonate with me quite a bit. Um, can you tell me how you define a human art and activism, and what that looks like, what that entails, and what you see as the future again of, a, of an antinatalist art movement, so to speak? So, okay, I can't tell you that because it's an impossible <laughs> question. Okay, I, I apologize. <laughs> why I can't tell you that? I think, as I said earlier, I think that it's really important that we celebrate creativity and imagination in any activism Mm -hmm. because there are two issues with current activisms that put us in a bind one is that people are subscribing to dogmatic systems that limit their ability to change patterns of human behavior so they'll follow various left factions or various right factions and then within those factions you have the left fighting with the left and you have the right fighting with the right and they have these same old repetitive ideas. And oftentimes people become more adherent to the group and the ideology than they do to the affects and the changes that those can bring about. So that's a problem with dogma. And the second problem is that in a way we've started to talk about a world where there's truth and there's Uh, you know, false news or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but that's different to something like science and fiction. But what people don't really embrace is that fiction is as capable of changing the world as science. Mm -hmm. Science reflects on something that is thought to be true. Whereas being inspired by something Mm -hmm. creates change through actions and Mm -hmm. they are true. Those actions are true. The expression is true and the affect is true. So this comes from a tradition of Spinozan ethics. Okay. So that means that art is how we create new modes of acting Mm -hmm. that we haven't done before. Sure. Which allows us to get out of repetitive patterns. Mm -hmm. So art, it doesn't matter if art is true or false. What matters is, can it activate people to behave differently? And we know yeah. from history that rhetoric as a form of art is able to make people do atrocious things, but also sure. do wonderful things. So we need to really embrace that art can be weird and bizarre and whatever, But in order to get out of our behaviours that we keep falling back on, art is where we can see 
the patterns changing and the potential differing, new trajectories of possibility opening up because it makes us think in bizarre ways. It rewires our brains. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, therefore, that what it looks like is absolutely contingent on where you are, mm -hmm. who you're concerned with. You know, we can't, there's an overwhelming sense that we have to fix everything. And if you're a vegan antinatalist, you're really like, all right, well, I want the end of humanity and I want the animals to be happy and I want this and I want that. Mm -hmm. um, and it can feel really overwhelming. And capitalism trains us to believe that if you can't do everything, don't do anything. Just make mm -hmm. yourself happy and right. then it'll all be okay. But that's, that's rubbish. I think that we need to be sort of tactical with our activism and say, okay, what can I do and how can I create something that will inspire and ignite people to act differently? And I know, you know, like, so I've, I've been vegan for nearly 20 years and every year I have like the sneaky vegan week in uh -huh. my classes that I teach. And I know that every year it changes because those students have a different understanding of what veganism means and what yeah. it looks like. And I also teach, um, well, I guess I teach antinatalism. I teach, I, because I teach feminism, I teach you yeah. don't have to reproduce in order to exist. Right. Um, and again, it looks different every year because it is about using theory and film creatively to make people think differently. So, you know, for some people, Earthlings is the clincher, but for some people, you know, a fiction film is the clincher or a piece of music is the clincher or yep, yep. a protest where they, they, they have a, a sense of community that they've never had before, where you don't all have to agree 100%. That's the clincher, you know. Yeah. And I think that the other thing antinatalism um, teaches is creating your own family. Yeah, absolutely. And that definitely comes from, you know, a relationship with the queer community as well. That mm -hmm. You don't have to be related and you don't have to agree 100% to have your people and to have your tribe. Absolutely. So that's what, that's what, I guess what the techniques look like. Yeah. But any any sort of description of what it actually looked like would be a more prescriptive sure i understand design. yeah that makes perfect sense yeah i i don't really think there's uh very many other more important tools than art in antinatalist activism because this is a wheel that we're sort of inventing how to do i mean it's there's never really been an activist antinatalist movement uh truly in the world um certainly not like the one that's attempting to be built today. Um, so yeah, I, I've always believed, and I've always tried to encourage other antinatalists that creativity is really one of the greatest tools that you have. You know? And it definitely sets antinatalism apart from yes. existential nihilism. Where yes. it's, and that's why I'm not really a fan of ethelism, because I think that it's self-indulgent and narcissistic and messianic and... Yeah. Well, now is where I have to break it to you that I am an Ephelist. Um, I did make a movie called The Ephelist, um, and I've been an Ephelist really? for 10 years, yes, uh, which I'm happy to share with you later. Um, so I do want to get into that subject in just a little while, because I do know you wrote about Ephelism in your, in your book. Um, so I did want to talk just a little bit about um, feminism a, a bit more, and just, just a little bit about what you wrote about sentience before we get into that subject, because I think that'll lead us into it fairly well. Is that, is that okay with you? Okay, excellent. Sure. Um, so I, I really do appreciate, we talked, you talked a little bit about this previously, but I really do appreciate that you wrote so much about feminism in your book. Um, as very few have done so yet, there's been very little writing about feminism and antinatalism uh, as of yet. And it seems like um, antinatalism has not yet reached feminist circles. And I'm very excited and terrified for when that happens, only just because I think it's going to be very controversial. Um, so, uh, I'm, oh, I, guess, it is. I have been, I have been, um, yeah, I've been sort of disowned by a few yeah. uh, sort of maternal figure feminists who no longer wish to speak to me and think I've had a nervous breakdown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I've sort of had similar 
I've sort of been in a similar position on top of it because I am gender queer and I am a bit sort of on the transgender spectrum. So they really don't want to hear my perspective on anti I mean, I just, that's, that's what I've encountered. I don't know if that's what's to be encountered in the larger world outside of the internet, but that's something I've encountered too. Um, so I'm really, I, I, but I do think that it's imminent that antinatalism will be a, a much wider topic in, in, in uh, feminism, sorry. Um, and so what do you see as the future of those, those two subjects commingling and what do you think that's Well, I think there's already, there's already a growing advocacy in certain animal studies feminism where the idea that the earth is our family mm -hmm. and i know that sounds hippie but actually it's not hippie it's quite hardcore um empirical ethics mm -hmm. um that because what it shows is the absolute absurdity and redundancy of this concept of bloodline of, of somehow because you bred it mm -hmm. it's got some profound relationship with you or something but sure that's that's it because then that's what leads to that's what leads to nationalism and all the kinds of alt-right stuff that is just a bit absurd mm. um, as well as dangerous. Um, but then one of the things that feminism has sort of been a victim of, I think, and this is, this is a pretty ingrateful and contentious thing for me to say because I have always been a feminist. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, there was a large wave of feminism that was all about maternity and femininity. Sure. And yes. what makes women special and what makes women unique is, you know, um, their capacity for reproduction again, as if they're parthenogenic. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I never, obviously, as I said, because I was always antinatalist, I never subscribed to that. And, I used to read a lot of feminist philosophy and the minute that the whole maternal stuff would start, I would think, oh God, not this again, because I didn't identify with that at all. And increasingly, obviously, um, reading a lot of queer studies, that I was liberated from that. Suddenly there was no babies in the picture and I thought, thank, thank you, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I also then became quite, an advocate of the relationship between gender and uh, or between feminism, I think perhaps, and heteronormativity, because you start seeing a lot of people who are, they're gay, but they're not queer. So they mm -hmm. follow these heteronormative patterns. Yeah. And I felt a bit like betrayed by that, but mm -hmm. you know, that, that then yeah. showed me the difference between identity politics and identity mm -hmm. and actually just this general refusal to be categorized which includes being categorized as human as more important than another animal right so so that's why i think actually for me because i i don't really have a very online life my life is yeah. usually real life but for mm -hmm. me the majority of the relationships i've had with feminists for years they were quite unhappy about my refusal of me first identity politics yeah and of any kind of politics that is driven purely by your own identity mm -hmm. even if it's intersectional because you're just you know oh well i better be intersectional because otherwise people will think i'm just selfish and i yeah i just I couldn't, I couldn't fathom how that was actually ethical. If you're not, yeah. if you're not ethically invested in something that gives you no benefit or payoff, then that's not ethical. That's just yeah. self-preservation. Sure. So I think that in a way, even now when I use the word feminism, I'm not sure what I mean anymore because I don't really care to identify as female. Mm -hmm. I do, however, hate the misogyny that I experience and I see others experience. Right. Yeah. And actually there's, there's a growing, you know, sometimes I get pretty pissed off with some of the antenatal vegan groups because uh -huh. some of the guys 
yeah. act as if women just pop babies out on their own or that yeah. women have some massive conspiracy to have babies against their will. And I just yeah. think, fuck a, you, dude. You know, like, yeah. it's, it's your own intercourse obsessed heteronormativity that's making these babies. So if you just learned how to have more interesting sex, then maybe it wouldn't <laughs> be happening. And, yeah. you know, so it's sort of on both sides, there is a conservatism of understandings of gender and desire that still, if you'll excuse the pun, breed nasalism. Right, yeah, yeah, very well said. There's a ton of misogyny in a lot of the antinatalist groups, and <laughs> we, we actually commented about that quite a bit in, in the last interview I did with the friendly antinatalist. Um, but yeah, and it, it's, it's very difficult to combat. And, um, but anyway, yes, I really appreciate your perspective into that. Um, and I just think that there is this huge future of, of a, a crossover between antinatalism and, and, and feminism. And um, again, I'm, I am very excited for that to happen because I've been sort of seeing it inch towards that for years now definitely the younger generation my yeah. students now the women are relieved when they find out they're gonna yeah. learn that they don't have to have babies they right. are like thank you yeah okay well yeah i was taught by nuns i was taught by nuns oh. so none of them had any interest i'm so sorry yeah <laughs> Oh, um, okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about the idea of sentience, just because I, I was a bit surprised in your book. Um, you say that the word sentience has deep rooted genealogy in anthropocentrism um, in creating a measure of equi equivalency between organisms. So I'm sorry if I'm misquoting that a bit, but um, so I've never actually really heard personally a critique of the word sentience. You prefer the term biosentience. Um, can you just speak a little bit about uh, why you don't dislike the term a bit more and, and why you prefer biosentience? Well, I guess it, go it comes down to the basic difference between animal rights slash welfareism and abolitionism, where sentience seems to indicate to fallacies. The first fallacy is that we can ever know the thought of the other species. We can know it and measure it. And I just think that is a hugely hubristic fallacy. And the second thing is, even if we could measure it, who cares if a pig is smarter than a dog? Mm -hmm. You're, you know, you're, you don't have to prove your worth to not be murdered. So it makes me very angry that any organism would have to somehow prove mm -hmm. why they shouldn't be a victim. In a way, it has a lot of equivalence with rape and mm -hmm. with the idea that the obligation is on the victim and not on the persecutor. And it's sort of the same with natalism, you know. Why are we making antinatalists prove their own position? Why aren't we asking the breeders, why are you doing this? This is not okay. And I feel the same way about sentience. The word sentience is basically asking a victim to prove why they shouldn't be murdered. And it, it relates to the beautiful work that well, I relate it personally to the beautiful work that Jean-Francois Lyotard did on the different, um, on the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and the idea that the other must speak their own value. And if they can speak their own value, then they're not victims. And if they can't speak their own value, they weren't worthy enough to be considered. I don't think that any organism should have to be able to enunciate its worth in anthropocentric terms Mm -hmm. in order to not be murdered. Yeah, I, 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 I can't disagree with that. I guess I've always had a different impression of the word sentience, that it is a announcement that this creature has the value. It has this value to suffer. And that, you know, I do believe it that does we- It because sentience has, has a concept of um, a certain form of agency, which may or may not be measurable. So for example, people like Peter Singer, he has a definite hierarchy of animal sentience, therefore, mm -hmm. You can do this to a starfish, but you can't do it to a chimp. Or you can do this to, um, you know, insects are fine, but um, maybe not so much a pig. Well, I, I, I have no interest in putting suffering on that kind of hierarchy. I just, I believe that it's important to recognize that if you are under this banner of a thing called sentient, 
that you have all of this sentient value, which is in the form of your ability to feel pain and experience neg negativity in any kind of way. So that's been my impression I still, of. I still think that's measuring the victim. Uh huh. And I, I, I suppose we're, I'm placing everybody in that victimhood, though. We are all brothers and sisters of the same DNA molecule. We all come from this one thing. And I believe that the full sentient voice is the only thing it's really saying is ouch. And that it's this emergency in the universe that that all of these creatures and that is the yeah, that is essentially the ethelist position by the way that we all come from one dna molecule evolution is not our friend <laughs> that sentience is not our friend the ability to feel pain and to suffer is not our friend and that yes there does need to be through antinatalism through ethical means there needs to be a form of sentient extinction but then is there a cutoff point how do you mean? So what I'm saying is that if we could establish a cutoff point for sentience, mm -hmm. because then you get, you know, then you get the plants no vegan, uh, anti-vegans. Well, the, the plants anti-vegan? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Right, well, you know the, uh, the Malzoans who say, but plants feel pain, so you shouldn't eat anything and go oh. kill yourself. <laughs> and while, while I, you know, while I think that that's a, a stupid argument yeah. what i also think is really important to remember is that humans have this propensity to pillage and to overuse whatever is available sure yeah so we shouldn't be doing that we should be accounting for our behavior rather than measuring other things so it's a broader paradigmatic focus on our propensity to use and to measure and to value and to, you know, convert everything into a potential resource. Right, and, and I am absolutely that against that, yeah. All. No, so I, I just, I think sentience is less relevant than our act actions and becoming accountable for those actions. Okay, well, let me, let me say, like, I, I, obviously, I cannot in any way disagree that humans are awful and have done terrible things and have not shown much of an ability to do the right thing, although I do think that we have the potential, and I do think, and I do believe in, in some form of human responsibility, so I, I, I um, and I, but I, but I appreciate that we have very different opinions of what that responsibility is, so, I, again, I think, just, uh, I'm just going to read the question that I had. I mean, I think we are in uh, deeply enmeshed right now in our two biggest pieces of contention um, that I had with with your views, the A Human Manifesto, um, though they are in many ways the same subject, and that is the idea of wildlife interventionalism and ethalism. So first, you seem to be very against forms of antinatalism that are sometimes called what is called sentiocentric. Um, and I know you got into it a little bit, but can you explain your views as to why that is essentially that you're against sentiocentric antinatalism. Think, so I'm going to, I'm going to say something that might seem contradictory. Okay. No, it's in terms of, in terms of decelerating our existence on earth, mm -hmm. we are going to have to develop measures of care. So I talk sure. about this concept of care. Yeah. That may be something that evolves intervention. Okay. Okay. But simultaneously i feel like that kind of intervention verges on a god complex uh-huh that humans even with the best of intentions still believe that they are the fathers of the earth and that right. they decide what's best for the earth and that they're the ones that are doing it for your own good so in a way they make the earth their child but also right. it's like the earth is made for them. And I think that conceptually and philosophically that is deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's no question. I don't mean to take quite that stance. I don't mean to uh, in any way um, <laughs> call the earth my child. Or, um, But I, I, I also feel 
like we have a responsibility to recognize the suffering in nature, that nature is where most of the suffering is on this planet, even regardless of the hell that we put the rest of the planet through ourselves. Um, and that the care, as you speak of, which I do agree of, is essentially needs to be palliative care, that it needs to be hospice care, essentially, that it, this has never been a, a good story. Even before humans were a part of the, the equation, animals were ripping each other's faces off, there's parasitism, there's starvation. It's not a good story. I mean, if they are free I, of I us. I feel like if that, if that were so, aren't you assuming inherently that you can understand the other because you're there for speaking for the other and you are deciding for the other i think that there are things about the other that are us i think we are them they are us How do you know? we, because we have we clearly respond to the same st st similar stimuli we know what a happy animal is we know what a suffering animal is i don't think and we I, know that i mean i think we i think we can probably see what a suffering animal is but I, I don't, I think that claiming to know what a happy animal is, is absurd. Well, you pretty much are saying that if we're gone, they're going to be happy. They're going to be, and that's the, that's the sense I'm that I got. That they that. Are... I'm saying, oh, no, no. I never okay. say that. I okay. say we, we don't have the right to continue to perpetrate the suffering that we do. Right. And I would agree what with that. What happens after we're yeah. gone? Who the fuck knows? But it can't be us that makes this happen anymore. I believe, though, that we are their one chance of escaping the bad game that they are already caught up in. And if we yeah, abandon that... That sounds messianic that, to me. It sounds what? Messianic? messianic? Yeah. How does it sound messianic? Like, we will save you. Well, I, I don't... I, that's not the way it's intended. I believe that we have every ability to recognize the suffering. And I think that we have also every ability to... I think that we are in the unfortunate position of being the only creatures on earth that can do anything about it. We're the only thing that can drive the bus effectively. And I but believe so that if we, question. sorry, go ahead. Like don't some ethicists believe that all life should be wiped out? Well, we could, we could end human life by a gradual course of anti-procreation. Now, how you yes, extinct I mean, the animals, that. how you extinct the animals, yeah, that does get a lot more complicated. Now, I, I like in the past, I have uh, advocated, well, maybe we could, you know, there's some sort of sterilization that we could do. There's this or that. And I've kind of come to recently find out that's probably not, not the case. Um, so I believe that it, it, it certainly is not, should not be up to me, that it needs to be a massive human project of how to ethically extinct the animals, how you do this palliative care, how you do this hospice care for wildlife. Now, the sad, horrible truth may be that the only thing that you can do is euthanasia. And I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's what we will find out. But I believe that this needs to be basically the greatest human project, that it would be an absolute tragedy if we were to go extinct before the animals, because we are the only thing that- Well, I guess that's go. absolutely the inverse of my position. It is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I really do think that sounds like a god complex. Okay, well, I don't mean for it to, I just think that it's, it's also abdicating all responsibility that human beings may have to leave them in the, in the 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 meat grinder of nature nature is not their friend but i um i think i think maybe the difference is that i've been vegan longer than i've been openly anti-natalist and mm -hmm. the majority the majority of suffering is human enforced i would disagree with that i think nature has been well, making a mess of things long before humans were even a part of the equation i okay so maybe Maybe then we are going to just have to, you know. That's, and that's fine. We can, we can, we, we, I'm happy to reach an impasse. Um, but I did um, want to, sorry, go ahead. Forgive me. Yeah. All right. No, that's it. Yeah. Um, so just two brief questions, though, uh, leading to that. Um, do you believe, so you, you spoke briefly about you, you would agree with some form of interventionalism because if we are gone, they are still caught up in this, in this bad game. Would you, so what would that, 
what would those acceptable forms of intervention be at all? Well, I mean, I think that the first and foremost things we have to do are stop the very obvious things, such as all use of animals for, mm -hmm. you know, so the, the things where the most animals are suffering right now, right this second as a direct result of us. Mm -hmm. I think that would be, and, and also that would mean uh, sterilisation of, all um, animals currently exploited for their meat, their milk, their whatever, right. all of that. Mm -hmm. I think if we're talking about a decelerated extinction, so say, you know, in a perfect world, no one breeds starting now, mm -hmm. um, we would also have to use a very artistic eye mm -hmm. to observe the different environments that are reinstated and we would have to attempt to reinstate through various forms of replanting and uh, diminishment of uh, a variety of environments and adaptation of a variety of environments. And to me, the artistry involved in that would see animal life flourish in ways that we have never perceived before. Okay. That is because animal life even wildlife will be different as we decrease diminish depopulate and then disappear hopefully um i feel very uncomfortable with forcibly murdering something because i've decided that they might suffer um well i am i am too i hope that that's not the answer you know that's but i also i also think that the you know like in terms of numbers mm -hmm. the amount of suffering that is being perpetrated by humans every day seven billion animals that's terrible that's going to be a big enough project mm -hmm. without worrying about fantasies of lions and zebras Okay. I mean, I think it's all of equal importance, but, but I appreciate what you're saying. Um, I just, just briefly just wanted to ask you just the tiniest bit more about ethelism, just in the sense that I noticed that there's, there's not really any references to it, like in your bibliography. Um, yeah, so, I, I, I reference um, David Benatar. Describes. But David Benatar is not an ethelist. He would, comp he would yeah. absolutely reject that, that title. Um, ethelism originates from YouTube. Actually, it was originated by the YouTube philosopher in Mendham. So, oh, um, so David I Benatar. Know. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I thought he was. I, I don't know. Do I call him an ethelist in the book? Maybe I do. Maybe you I do. don't. You do. Oh, okay. You also say ethelists are primarily stereotypical white men, which is. Well, my experience personally of ethelists at various conferences has been that. Okay, okay. I, I, I just think you're lumping all of sentiocentric antinatalism underneath the banner well, of ethelism, and they wouldn't agree with that. Maybe I am. The thing is, I didn't actually mention ethelism in the first draft, but I was told to because I, see. Um, I was told I didn't mention the hemp either because, you know, this manifesto is a manifesto that I stand behind. I understand. Yes. And I didn't want, I actually didn't want to tarnish, you know, other groups with my brush. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. But it seems like it's gone the other way and other groups <laughs> are saying, you know, we're tarnishing you. Um <laughs> It's one of those things, you know, it's like when you when you write a book or you write a PhD or something where you mention things because people might have never heard that this exists. Sure. And they're reading it and they think you're a lunatic. Why are you writing this? So you mention the other things. Yeah. Um, and one of my readers says, oh, you have to mention David Benetton. He's a, he's a men's rights activist. Of course, I didn't want to mention him. But um, he's not really a men's rights activist. But His first book was. It, he wrote about soldiers and it's not it's not the same as I, I i would not consider the second sexism a male well, rights activist book i i'm not a fan um it's okay so that was it that was not the message of my book was not i'm going to teach you about ethelism and no ethelism. of course not of course not no, so no. that was not my responsibility and also the tradition of moral philosophy that that follows is very different to continental post-structural philosophy as a field in general sure of course so it's a very different genealogy to mine philosophically speaking mm -hmm. okay yeah 
fair enough. Um, just, I just really have like two more questions um, about activism. Uh, so I just was curious what you think needs to happen first. I mean, where do we, where do we go from the A Human Manifesto? What needs to, what needs to start happening immediately? What I think everyone needs to be an abolitionist vegan tomorrow. And if they don't, then they should eat their children. <laughs> okay. I just, I, I find the arbitrary excuses for not being that yeah reprehensible and illogical to the point of absurd mm -hmm. i just don't get it you know i i i know people who in every respect are so woke that they're like exploding <laughs> yeah. with wokeness and then they'll sit down and eat meat or drink milk or something and right. i'm like what right. the fuck is going on here you know yeah. um so that because yeah. it's easy it's easy um, but I also think that because life is overwhelming and we are bombarded a lot, I think that people need to refine what they think is the most critical way for activism to work. Mm -hmm. And I think, in my opinion, but also it's pretty much true, being an abolitionist, giving up all of these stupid anthropocentric traditions like having babies, Mm -hmm. asking why am I here, what's the meaning of life, giving up all that and actually trying to create queer relations with the earth is something that is overwhelming but that also could be really curious and fun mm -hmm. and weird. Um, so that. Okay. I mean, it seems pretty easy. Don't have a kid. Yeah. And don't eat meat. Don't. <laughs> don't. Be a fucking oppressing asshole. Yeah. 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 It shouldn't be too hard. I think that that's my biggest sort of confoundingness. That yeah. otherwise ethical people are doing things that are so easy not to do. Yeah. Um, I also think that those things are structured, and I've just structured them that way grammatically, actually. So I apologize. As oh, privations, uh -huh. okay. whereas they're not privations, as you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of jubilance to be found in uh, abolitionist antinatalists. There's a lot of joy. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And we need to acknowledge and account for that as well and say, why are you structuring this as a privation? Is it because you just don't want to not be an asshole? Right. Um, I think that humans really need to stop being so fucking human. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well said. Uh, so Patricia, where can people find you? Uh, do you have anything that you wish to plug? What can we expect from you in the future? Uh, well, you can buy the new book and it's actually pretty affordable for an academic book. It is. Yeah. Um, I appreciated that. <laughs> it's my seventh book. So, but there's also a lot of free stuff, um, that you can read if you're interested I would, um, look, I'm just happy that there are people supported. Like I get a lot of supportive emails because I yeah. was really actually shocked that the book has a lot of stuff in it that people could get a bit upset about, uh -huh. but it was antinatalism that got me the hate mail. I'm so sorry and to hear that, that. I really am. But that, yeah. was a, that was a very curious thing. You know, I didn't get any hate mail from meat eaters. I didn't get any hate mail from, um, people saying that I was an occultist or anything like that. It was, you know, I got a bit of backlash from the feminist community, but it was sort of thoughtful backlash. It wasn't hate yeah. mail. Yeah. But yeah, I got the death threats because of the antinatalism. So I would say that maybe people, if, if they're antinatalists, be a bit more out. You know, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> um, well, that's a big problem in antinatalism is that most antinatalists are very uh and you know they, they they practice the anonymity thing tremendously and it's very difficult to get antinatalists to be active and to be vocal yeah i also i also notice that there are a lot of people in the feminist community who are maybe a little bit older than me but not much who actually say i i love my child but i regret having them because they had a child when they were like 20. Mm -hmm. if Feminists in their 50s can say, I regret having a child, and if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't. Then antinatalists should come out. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to have more discussions about acknowledging 
why we actually breed and ultimately acknowledging that it's a really selfish thing to do. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, beautiful. Well, um, that's pretty much all that I had prepared for today. So Patricia, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I just, I was so thrilled when you said yes. (laughs) So so thank you again for your time. And uh, yeah, everybody, please go check out uh, the A Human Manifesto. Um, But any closing thoughts whatsoever you have? (laughs) Well, there was a massive thunderstorm during this interview so that was kind of interesting oh <laughs> lovely i don't know if you noticed the room going dark but it went really i did dark. a little bit yeah <laughs> sorry a little so, mood lighting you know if you want to anger right <laughs> and if, you want, if you want some, if you want beautiful some sunny day yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right but well, no lovely. i don't have anything to add i'm just i'm just really pleased that uh uh this is something that people are now discussing i think it's great yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I really love it because it was, you know, just when I first started on being a YouTube antinatalist 10 years ago, there really were like five of us, you know, and now it's like there's a South American group on, on uh, Facebook that has over 100,000 members. There's the group that, you know, originates in Syria and Egypt and stuff that has over 70,000. So it's like, it's just mind boggling. So it's, it's, uh, it is wonderful to see it grow. But because it has grown so much, it does surprise me that you got the kind of backlash that you got well, to the I think subject. I, because yeah. I'm not, as I said, because I'm not really online much. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea there were so many antinatalists because yeah. academically there's been very little written. Right. I think that will change though. I do. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. Patricia McCormack's The A-Human Manifesto, Activism for the End of the Anthropocene can be purchased at www.bloomsbury.com. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Once again, this has been Old Fan. You can find me at Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, as well as keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on our YouTube channel, Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout and iTunes. We also have a new website, still under construction, www.exploringantinatalism.com. Podcast artwork donated by the incredible Life Sucks. All the best, and bye for now.